as well. Everybody in New York, turn around, say hi to everybody else, wherever they are. It's great to see you this evening. Has everybody had a nice week? Good feelings about 2017? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> All right. Please introduce yourself to the people who are around you, to your right, to your left, in front of you, and behind you. Ready? All right. <clears throat> Let's all take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger, until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. And we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together tonight, all of our experiences together, to him. And we pray that his most Holy Spirit be upon us, lifting us above and beyond the turmoil, the limitations, and the fears of this world to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. <clears throat> I want to begin with reading a paragraph from page 668 in the text of The Course in Miracles, which says, My brothers in salvation, do not fail to hear my voice and listen to my words. I ask for nothing but your own release. There is no place for hell within a world whose loveliness can yet be so intense and so inclusive it is but a step from there to heaven. To your tired eyes, I bring the vision of a different world. So new and clean and fresh, you will forget the pain and sorrow that you saw before. Yet this a vision in which you must share with everyone you see, for otherwise you will behold it not. To give this gift is how to make it yours. And God ordained in loving kindness that it be for you. You know, it was a... It was actually the night before New Year's Eve, I was at a dinner party. <clears throat> and after dinner, one of the guests said, why don't we go around the table and everybody say, what is it that you want to give up this year? And what is it that you want new for next year? And I was struck by how many people who were at the table said that what they wanted to give up was fear. That fear was what they wanted to not be taking with them into the year 2017. And I thought about that, obviously, in terms of what The Course in Miracles has to say. Because The Course in Miracles talks about fear a lot. It is part of the fundamental philosophy of A Course in Miracles. Because the basic teaching of the Course is that love is real and nothing else exists. Meaning that when our mind is thinking with love, we are literally co-creating with God, and God is that which is eternal and changeless. But when we are thinking without love, because God is all there is, when we are thinking without love, we're actually not thinking, we're hallucinating actually. This entire three-dimensional reality. Either the experience of the world that we know is one of love in which it is literally a co-creation with God, or we are experiencing a vast delusion which feels very real while we're in it, but is actually not real because only God is and what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. The Course in Miracles says that thought, when it is not loving, 
when we are not extending love, i.e. extending the thinking of God, i.e. being our authentic selves, since we ourselves are thoughts in the mind of God, we are projecting fear. The Course in Miracles says that there are only two emotions, love and fear. That which is not love is fear. Any thought which is love produces peace. Any thought which is not loving produces fear. And then fear has many different categories, anxiety, despair, depression, and so forth. So the Course in Miracles tells us that fear is to love what darkness is to light. Darkness is not actually a thing. It is the absence of a thing. When they come into the church and it's dark in here, they don't get baseball bats out and start trying to hit the darkness. Rather, they turn on the light because in the absence of the light, the fear disappears. Excuse me, the darkness disappears. Similarly, when the mind is used for the purposes of love, in that moment that my mind is being used for the purpose of love, I cannot fear. Now, we live in a society, the very prevailing paradigm of which, and this is not just true to our society, because in a larger sense, it has to do with a thought system that has ruled humanity's consciousness for ages. That thought system, whether we're talking about the one that has dominated the human race for ages, or whether you are specifically honing in, as it is easy to do, on the peculiarities of this American go get them attitude, is an absolute font of fear. It is an absolute fear-producing machine because everything that we're talk, told about who we are and what our purpose is on the planet is a maelstrom, is a matrix of thought that is bound to produce fear. Why is that? Because, number one, we're taught that we're separate from each other. We're taught that we are bodies. That itself is a fearful thought. Because, in fact, the Course in Miracles says your body is just a suit of clothes. The real you is not body but spirit. Your body was born, your body will die, but we, the Course of Miracles says, the, the birth is just not the beginning, it's just a continuation of our eternal life. Physical death is not an end, it's just a continuation of our eternal life. So we're taught that we're only here for this instant. So that's a lot of pressure right there in terms of what we have to get done in a certain period of time. But also being taught that we're bodies, we're taught that we are separate from each other. The Course in Miracles, and you've heard me say this many times, that image that's so powerful in the Course, where it says that we are like sunbeams to the sun, thinking we're separate from other sunbeams. We're like waves in the ocean, thinking we're separate from other waves. Now think about the psychological difference between seeing yourself as a wave separate from the rest of the ocean versus thinking of yourself as a wave that is one with the rest of the ocean. If I think of myself as a wave that's separate from the rest of the ocean, how can I not be terrified of all the other waves? How can I not be terrified of the ocean? How can I not be terrified that at any moment I will be obliterated? Other waves will be bigger than me. Other waves will swallow me up. If, on the other hand, I think of myself as one with the wave, then I know I'm one with the ocean, one with the other waves, one with the ocean. The power of the ocean is mine. The ocean moves, I move, I move, this ocean moves. So if I relate to myself as like one with the ocean, I feel like what I am, the most powerful force on the planet. On the other hand, if I think of myself as one little wave, how could I not live in terror? And that is how we are. If I think of myself as separate from you, I cannot not fear you. I will fear that you are dangerous to me on some level. I fear what you might do to me. I fear that you will engulf me. Or I fear that you will abandon me. I fear you. I feel I have to compete with you. So you, who are the rest of the human race, become an object in which I perceive myself as separate. And the perception of ourselves as separate, that is the ego mind. The mind which knows I am one with you is a mind that knows that although my physical senses tell me I am separate from you, my physical senses are not the arbiter of ultimate reality. 
The physical senses are not the arbiter of ultimate reality because they reflect back to me evidence of the three dimensions, and the three dimensions themselves are illusion. As Einstein said, albeit a persistent one, but an illusion nonetheless. So the three dimensions to say, and the Course in Miracles points out, you see an airplane and takes off from the, from the runway, and the further away it gets, the smaller it gets. So you have all kinds of evidence that just the fact that my physical senses see it doesn't mean it's happening quite the way my physical senses perceive. And enlightenment is a shift in self-identification from body identification to spirit identification. Body identification is the ego mind. The ego mind will tell me I am separate from you, and all, only fear can result from that. Now, not only does the ego mind tell me that I'm separate from you, that makes life seem dangerous right there, because there's so much that can destroy me. There is so much that I have to fight for. But it also tells me that my purpose on the earth is to go out there and do whatever I want to do, you know? Go out there, you gotta survive, you gotta make it, you gotta take the bull by the horns. Once again, this is the thinking we're taught. This is the prevailing kind of American mantra, go out there, you can do it. Now, there's an upside, definitely, to the whole notion of, of, of enlightened individualism and rugged individualism. There is an upside to that. But the downside is when it's used for the ego mind for the ego's purposes. Now, remember, the way the mind operates, the Course in Miracles says, is that it is as though the mind has been split in two. One part of the mind is the truth of who you are, and it remains in contact with God at all times, because being an idea in the mind of God, you actually cannot be separate from the mind of God. However, living on this earth leads us to believe and to experience ourselves as separate from God, because our thinking tells us that we are not one, that we are not one with the universe, and our thinking based on our physical senses, does not reflect back to us anything other than that we are here as isolated individuals. Now, when I'm thinking I'm an isolated individual, any thought that stems from that will give me fear. I got to go out there and do it. I don't know what's going to happen in 2017. I don't know how I'm going to get a job. I don't know if I'm going to have a relationship. I don't know what Trump's going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. And you live in constant fear. And it makes us weak, and it, 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 and it leaves us out of our power. And it's all about how we got to go make it happen in 2017, although in a very ironic way, the very concept that I got to go out and make it in 2017, because the thinking which produces that thought is itself, is itself such a weak one, the more I have this thought that I have to go out there and do it in 2017, the less I am probably going to be able to. Or even if I am able to, it will come with a high personal cost, because I'm always like this. I'm always like this. And that's how most of us live today. Always like this. They're going to get me or I won't have enough of this or I won't have to, enough of that. And actually that disempowers us. Now, The Course in Miracles says salvation begins when you consider the possibility that there might be another way. And what is salvation? You know, because in this section I read, it says, <clears throat> my brothers in salvation, what is there to be saved from? What is there? I'm saved. What is there to be saved from? I'm saved from my own neurotic thought patterns. That's the only thing to be saved from. Everything that we experience is a product of our thinking. So if you want to be saved from the effect, you have to be saved from the cause. The cause is your own insanity. Like they say in AA, your best thinking got you here. The whole human race, hello, your best thinking got you here. The thinking that we think, or they say in AA also, stinking thinking, right? So you realize that if you want your life to change, you change the level of effect by changing the level of cause. You are saved from the craziness of the mental habit patterns that dominate this planet. You, that's why the miracle is a shift in perception from the thoughts of fear to the thoughts of love. And that's that you take a very different approach to a new year. You don't say, okay, this is what I want to make happen in 2017. First of all, that whole why I want to go out and make it happen thing, got to go out and take the bull by the horns, that's a pretty suicidal thing to do, taking the bull by the horns. The Course in Miracles, the entire paradigm is more like there are angels pushing you from behind. 
In the Talmud, in the Jewish Book of Wisdom, it says that over every blade of grass, there is an angel, and the angel is whispering, grow, grow, grow. That the universe, natural intelligence, somebody gave me a bulb, right, at, at Christmas, and every day you watch this thing open. Nature is so amazing. My daughter and I were just in awe of it. It starts with just this bulb, and then you have these extraordinary flowers. That's how nature works. Nature is intentional. Nature is intentional in that DNA of the embryo to become the baby and the acorn to become the oak tree, in that bud to become the blossom, and in you to become the man you're capable of being, and you to become the woman that you are capable of being. We have spiritual DNA. But the issue is not only that that natural intelligence works, it's not only that God's plan works, but the opposite is true. Yours doesn't. Now, that's, that's a big deal. Because when we go out there to do and make it happen, particularly when we're coming from fear of what might happen if we don't, meaning that our core belief is that it's a dangerous world. So on one level or another, it's going to be a dangerous world. And you're going to constantly, I know people like that. They live like this. It's always this. I've got to be afraid of the relationship. I've got to be afraid of the job thing. I've got to be afraid. I'm professionally afraid. I'm personally afraid. It's just we live in this constant state of fear. And then even if you get it together this way or you get it together that way, then it starts to take a toll on your body. And, and we see the craziness with which we're living totally as a human race. Salvation begins when we consider the possibility that there must be another way. That is what the spiritual path is. It's another way. I said to a friend of mine the other day, we were talking about this kind of stuff, and I said, well, you have to just give your life to God to guide. And he said, I know I've been giving my life to God. How do you do that? And I thought about the Course in Miracles because the Course is a very practical course. This is a how-to. It's a how-to in the sense of how to think. So you wake up in the morning. One of the exercises in the Course says that we are to say every morning, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And to whom? Now, we're taught, go out there, figure out what you want, and go for it. Once again, this produces fear, because how can you know what's best? How can you know what's going to happen tomorrow? How can you know which person would be best, which job would be best? And that's why we're all living in fear. Instead, there's this notion that the same natural intelligence guides the embryo to a baby. An embryo doesn't have to say, I will become a baby. I will become a baby. And it doesn't have to say, I can make this happen. I can make this happen. There is a natural intelligence that guides every, even from the time of the, the first sperm and the first egg coming together. And then through this awesome natural process, these cells emerge. These cells are filled with the natural intelligence. They are, they are guided to collaborate with each other, to become that which they are in order to collaborate with other cells, in order to become a brain, in order to become fingers, in order to become lungs, in order to become heart, and so forth. In fact, when a cell goes insane and loses its natural intelligence, disconnects from its natural intelligence for some reason, and goes off to do its own thing, I'm not thinking about collaborating with other cells to serve something higher than both of us and bigger than both of us. No, I want to go over here and do my own thing. i got to find people. i got to find other cells who can join with me and do our own thing. That's called a tumor. It is malignant. It is malignant. I don't even know what's ha funny about that. It is malignant in the body, and it is malignant in consciousness. It destroys. When you go off just to do your own thing because you want to, it doesn't lead you to happiness, and it doesn't even lead you to success. Because even if it leads you to some kind of worldly success, because the core belief is still, it's just about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, then you're not dwelling in a universe of peace. And sometimes people will say, well, but if I, if I make all that money, see, or if I have that professional success or whatever it is, then I will get the things that make me happy. But the truth is the opposite. Find your peace and find your happiness, and success comes naturally. Why? Because you just happen to have genius in you. Because God placed it in all of us. Every cell in the body, nature is a perfect ecosystem. Nature is a perfect ecosystem, not only outside, 
but also inside. I notice that as a mother, how childhood is this perfect ecosystem. Relationships are a perfect ecosystem. An ecosystem is where when all parts are allowed to follow the way of nature, they all fit together in perfect ways. And so when we may say something like, may God's will be done, don't kid yourself. May God's will be done may means may God's love, will, thought, prevail. If I say in a relationship, may God's will be done, that means may I see the, them through the eyes of love and may they see me through the eyes of love. My, my love is my natural intelligence. That person's love is their natural intelligence. May this person not see my guilt. May I not see their guilt. May they not see their guilt. May I not see my guilt. That we might see each other truly in any situation, in any business project. You go into it. You go, you have a book you want to write. You have a business you want to start. You have any project that you're working on, may God's will be done. May God's will be done. You know, we, we have these thoughts that become these kind of platitudes, like just get out of the way. But I think a lot of us feel like, how do you do that? Before I started The Course in Miracles, when people would say to me, just let it go, Marianne, that would just make me more hysterical. Let it go to what? I thought, what, what, just let it go to randomness and chaos? But what you learn is that the ego is the mind of randomness and chaos. Now, the ego, however, does not show up in your life saying, hi, I'm your self-hatred. No, 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 no. It doesn't say, hi, I'm the part of your mind, which would tell you that you're not who you actually are, that you are who you actually aren't, which would totally give you a completely insane perspective on pretty much everything, lead you to a life of struggle and despair, have you win sometimes, just enough to keep you in the game, but basically sabotage everything, and then at a certain point, you'll get sick and you'll die. That's what the ego mind is. And we keep thinking, maybe if I partner with the ego just one more time. The spiritual path is a radical departure. It is a radical shift. It's a radical shift into God, use me. Use my hands, use my feet, use my intelligence, use my past, use my present, use me where I get it right, use me where I get it wrong. Come over my mind, guide me, show me where I get it wrong. When I'm tempted to judge, put me back on track. When I'm tempted to control, put me back on track. When I'm withholding forgiveness, put me back on track. When I'm not seeing myself clearly, put me back on track. When I'm not seeing other people, put me back on track. When I'm not being responsible to myself or others, put me back on track. You, divine intelligence, know that I am mentally schooled in the ways of neurosis and pathology. And I am constantly, as the Course in Miracles says, the ego speaks first and the ego speaks loudest. So prayer is the medium of miracles because you are requesting help. You don't have this thought that you can handle it by yourself. Once again, going back to AA, this idea that your life has become unmanageable. One of the reasons, you know, I'm not, I'm not an addict in terms of substance abuse, but there is one truth spoken in many different ways. And 12 Steps is one of those spiritual paths that that comes right from that mind of divine intelligence. And so the principles, just like the principles of A Course in Miracles or any other serious spiritual path, they're all one. And this idea of complete surrender in knowing, I can't do this. So the entire way of the world is, got to go out there and do it. The way of surrender is, I can't. I, I don't even have the, how would I know how to do it? You don't hold the stars up in the sky. And that's really the message here. The message is, you can let the power that keeps the planets revolving around the sun run your life. Or you can do it yourself. <laughs> so the idea is realizing that if left to my own devices, I will blow it. And that's why you, you come to realize that the spiritual path is not the life of sacrifice. It's not a life of uh, some goody goody. It's not a life of I want to be a good girl so that after I die I go to heaven. No, 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 no. It's I want to be sane so that the rest of this day I will not be totally in despair and anxiety and neurosis and craziness. And I won't blow it and I won't sabotage. And I won't make a fool of myself and I won't all that. You realize that the ego mind is not this mind that says, well, you've well, you got to take care of yourself. There's a lot of that in the world today. You've got to take care of yourself. Well, you know, the Course in Miracles is real big on, on t pointing out that there's a difference between self with a little s and self with a big s. So what the ego mind means, well, you've got to go out there and take care of yourself, right? 
is actually usually means, if you take a brutally honest look at your life, that you did something thinking at the time it was taking care of number one, and then you see later it didn't take care of number one. It totally set you up for failure. It set, other people could smell it. Other people didn't like it. Other people didn't want to help you. Because you didn't come across like a person in healthy self-care. You came across selfishly. You came across like somebody who was was not really there for the right reason. See, everybody knows everything on a subconscious level. Everybody is always communicating with everybody subconsciously. That's why we point out all the time, you know, this world says, uh, you know, you got to have the resume, you got to have the ability, you got to have the experience. We were talking about that the other day. But really, you know what? There will always be somebody whose resume is as good as yours. There will always be somebody whose connections are as good as yours, whose talent is as good as yours, as, as intelligence as high as yours. There will all, all, always be somebody. And those things, I'm not saying they're not important in life, but they are not the winning edge. The winning edge in life is when you're carrying something. And it's, it's actually where the word charisma came from. Charisma comes, it's a spiritual concept. It means of the light, you've just got something else going on. The Course in Miracles talks about a light in your eyes. And when you have that light in your eyes, because what's being reflected back to you, see the Course in Miracles defines light as understanding. So when you quote unquote see the light, you understand. The enlightened are those who understand. What is there to understand? That this world is not what we think it is. This is not this low level thing where, thing where we're all just stuck here randomly into this chaotic universe trying our best to get what we can in the little time we have allotted to us. The enlightened understand that we are here to serve the ages. This is not just about you, and that's really a key for 2017 and the political situation. This is not just about you. This is about a much bigger picture in terms of what America means in the world. It's a much, much bigger, bigger picture than just any one, one generation. It's about a long line. We are called to, to answer to history. We are here to serve our ancestors. We are here to serve generations after us. When you're thinking, it's just lifted to that. It's all about lifting. It's like when you look at the, the architecture in a church, or you look at the architecture in a synagogue, you look at the architecture in a mosque, it's always pointing you upward, 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 upward. Point to the big picture, not just you. It's not just you. The best advice anyone ever gave me, the best advice I ever give myself when I'm off is get over yourself. And yet this world tells us the opposite of that. Make it about you. When you go into a situation and it's all about you, it doesn't attract other people. It doesn't attract other people to want to help you. It, it doesn't. The way to, to stand charismatically in any situation, and you can't fake this, it's not just behavioral, uh, behavioral modification. I mean, a behavioral shifts emerge from it, but the behavioral shifts emerge from a different kind of thinking, which has to do with what's going on on your subconscious level that everybody can sense subconsciously, whether they know they can or not, which is you're serving a distant star. This also has something to do with the shift in paradigm around leadership. Leadership is when you're holding the space for the brilliance of other people. Other people aren't going to follow you just because you're saying, follow me. That stuff's old, and, and people are unattracted to that because they can sense the ego in that. A leader, a real leader, is, doesn't think of himself or herself as a leader. A real leader thinks of himself or herself as a follower. That's what Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, that you are the follower of that distant star, which is then reflected in your eyes. The Course in Miracles says that you then have a light in your eyes which people who share that light will see as a collaborator. That's why the Course in Miracles says that at a certain point in your journey, you will not go forward alone, for mighty companions will join you. Like you're onto something, and you and I can just see it. There'll be just this kind of like, we want to have coffee because we recognize each other, this rapport. I, we both know we're sort of going about that same stuff. And the Course in Miracles says, when, when other people who do not yet have that light in their eyes see it, they'll wonder what it is and they will be attracted to it. Because you're living not from fear. 
You've, you've moved to a higher story. You don't wake up in the morning wondering how you're going to survive and how you're going to make it happen. Life intends that you survive, but life intends more than that. It intends that you thrive. It intends that you be lifted to your highest level of creative possibility. And I can see this in my life. The times that I've succeeded the most in worldly terms, the times when everything's manifest the most in worldly terms, was when I was not trying to make that happen. And any time you're just trying to make that happen, you're lowering your vibration. And so actually, you no longer have what Martin Luther King called cosmic companionship. And that's what you want to have in life. You want to have cosmic companionship. Now, once again, what's the how-to? Well, you're just saying, may my job, may my career, may my talents, may whatever, serve God. And then you say, well, what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, one of the most interesting things in the Course in Miracles is a concept. Beware the temptation to self-initiated plans. That's an interesting one. Beware the temptation to self-initiated plans. Because remember when I said, the, the, and I talk about this a lot in Return to Love, how God's plan works and yours doesn't. So we're taught, well, figure out what it is you want to do. This paradigm is different. It's not, quote unquote, figuring out what you want to do. It's asking God to show you how you could best be of service. That's a different mindset. Figuring out. We're, we're, the ego is real into figuring it out. But the most fundamental things in life you cannot figure out. Kierkegaard talked about the leap of faith. You know, that's why people get stuck in relationships. Do you want to be with this person? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. That, that's, not, that's not how love operates. It's what your heart calls you to. But the ego mind says that that's the voice you cannot trust. But spirit says it's the only voice that you can trust. Because your ego is the part of your mind that has no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And it's not asking, how might I collaborate with this person? That's the question. How might you and I collaborate for the purposes of mutual enlightenment? Now, once you understand that collaborating for the purposes of mutual enlightenment is the same thing as collaborating for the purposes of mutual joy, then you're in it with life with a big yes. Otherwise, you're going around life saying no to things and almost incapable of saying yes. It actually paralyzes you. You might be on a lot of airplanes. You might be traveling a lot. But you have this sense that you're just running around like a chicken with your head chopped off. So you don't say, I'm going to figure out what I want to do. You live from a place of, how can I best be used? You know, like in the Bible, the holy, the servant of the Lord, the handmaiden of the Lord. It's true. You're asking that your hands and your feet be used in a way that serves the whole. One cell is assigned to the lungs. One cell is assigned to the heart. One cell is assigned to the pancreas. And it's assigned to collaborate with other cells. And the cells that go out there to do their own thing and become the malignancies, that's a destructive, that's a destructive pattern rather than a creative pattern. So beware the temptation to self-initiated plans. I've had people who have said to me, you know, this project didn't, uh, didn't uh, succeed or that project didn't succeed. The first question is, were you asked to do it? I know when I ran for Congress, I ran for Congress a couple of years ago, and I had a lot of time to think about what went wrong and what went right. And I was very prayerful in my decision about whether to do it. That I had right. Where I was not so prayerful, although you don't realize it at the time. I mean, any time you wake, you know, no, when you think of the biggest mistakes you made ever in your life, you didn't wake up that morning saying, oh, I think I'll be a jerk today. <laughs> uh, or when you make the biggest mistakes in your life, you didn't wake up saying, I think I'll just blow this today. But you get so into the thinking of the world. And so I realized that my consciousness was totally in alignment on whether or not to run but it was not in alignment on how to actually run a campaign, right? And so it's not just what you do, but how you do it. It's a rat because it is so radically different than the thinking of the world. And so then anytime you do decide to do things radically different than the thinking of the world, I'll give you another example for me professionally, as long as we're talking about utter failures. Um, my second book, my first book that I ever, uh, that I wrote was called A Return to Love. And that book was, uh, became very well known because of Oprah Winfrey. 
Now, after you have a big book, and this is how the world operates, right? Then you're like making it, and then you got the big publishers, you got the big publicists, got the big everybody, got the people in suits, all that stuff, right? And I remember I wrote my second book. And then, you know, you're in the big time, you're in the big time, got to have a national show when the book comes up, right? You really think you're in the realm of what the world calls success, but which from a spiritual perspective, watch out because the temptation's severe.